Hello, my name is Jamila Edwards, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's FASD webcast, Operationalizing Best Practice Research, part of a monthly series of webcasts on issues related to FASD. This webcast is part of the FASD Cross Ministries Initiative and 10-year FASD strategy to provide accessible educational sessions that cover a broad range of topics that are accessible to all Albertans. For more information about this series, check your emails for our regular updates or go to hslearningseries.ca or by following us on Twitter at AB Human Services. You will be able to pose your questions to myself via our live chat window. I will address as many of these questions at the end as we come to the end of the presentation. Paige Boudreau is our online moderator today. She'll pose your web chat questions to our speakers. Today's session is also being recorded and the video will be posted on the Alberta FASD website about two weeks after the live session. So now let's get started. Like I said, my name is Jamila Edwards and I'm the Executive Director for Calgary Fetal Alcohol Network. I'll tell you a little bit more about our network. We are one of 12 regional networks that operate across the province of Alberta. Locally, we are the Calgary uh, and area regions, so Calgary and surrounding rural areas. We currently partner with eight frontline service providers who deliver FASD-specific services. And this is all part of Alberta's 10-year FASD strategy, who we partner, we partner with the government of Alberta quite extensively in that work. Our, war, our role in the community, primarily as a network, is to be a front of house, a front stop for anyone in the community looking for FASD-specific services, but also to be an advocate and a champion for individuals and families who are affected by FASD. We play a strong role in the community around capacity building and coordination of local services. So a little bit more about today's um, session. Beginning around 2013-2014 as a network, we became very interested in understanding at a deeper level the impact our services were having in the community with families directly. We knew from provincial evaluation data that our services were good, they were having an impact, but they also did vary considerably in terms of target audience, program design, and measurable outcomes that they were delivering. So in addition to knowing that we were doing good work, we really wanted to know why we were doing good work and what establishes good work in the community. So in 2014, we began a project uh, to uh, really understand, um, understand the established and also emerging uh, best practice trends in FASD interventions across the lifespan. And we wanted to use this evidence to inform the service delivery that we were supporting and the evaluation amongst both FASD specific services, but also to other community-based service providers that were working with clients who had FASD. Based on that work, we wanted to engage our community partners so we can be in the community advisory committee of several um, partners who are currently delivering services through the network, but also community partners who are engaged in local academic institutions and also other sectors like justice. From that, we also uh, we initiated a, a participatory uh, community action uh, research project where we did a number of uh, literature reviews and surveys which we'll go into. And the goal of that was really to examine the existing evidence that would better support our service delivery portfolio and also to build up our, what we would call our capacity building efforts. So where is it that we needed to build strength and where is it that we felt that we needed to continue to invest in work that was going really well. Overall, today's session will go through an overview of that research as well as two of our service providers who are actually living the work and then really showing how this research is impacting their frontline practice. So with that, I will turn it over to Kaylee Ramage, who is the uh, staff that worked with us at the time to lead the research. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the purpose of the project, um, the methodology that we used to conduct the research, um, a little bit about the evidence on what to do from the literature, experts, and the community, and then I'm going to hand it over to my um, co-presenters to, to show how to take that evidence into practice. So the purpose of the study, as Jamila alluded to, was to inform the practices of CFAN, its funded agencies, and external stakeholders through an examination of the best practices for FASD intervention and support services throughout the lifespan. Um, so 
Best practices for FASD, um, what we found when we were going through the literature is that there's really not a lot of best practices. Um, so those are usually considered things that have been rigorously evaluated or tested through controlled um, experiments. There's really not a lot of that in the literature. So um, what we will refer to going forward is evidence. And we had a specific way to evaluate this um, in our literature. Um, we also focused on FASD intervention and supports, so not necessarily prevention or diagnosis services, but specifically um, what service providers can be doing. Um, finally, we focused on air, um, supports for FASD throughout the lifespan, so ch childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. So we had, um, as Jamila said, we had an advisory panel made up from members of our community. So we had members of the caregiver community, um, academic disability, um, the justice sector, a lot of really great people that helped to uh, make this project work really well. We also conducted a literature review of the existing um, academic literature and gray literature on the subject. We did a community survey and as well as focus groups. So this really helped us to get an idea of what was going on in the community, what they knew, um, what, what they could tell us about um, things from the front line. I'm not gonna talk as much about that today, but if you'd like to, you can read that in our full report. That can be found on the CFAN website. Um, so going back to uh, assessing the evidence, what we found was there not, wasn't a lot of really good evidence or best practice evidence. Um, so that would be considered two or more controlled studies. This um, rubric was taken from a Health Canada study done in 2000 on best practices in FAS, um, FAS and FAE as it was referred to then. Um, so good evidence would be two or more controlled studies. As I said earlier, that's generally not, um, not available in the FASD research around interventions or supports. Um, moderate evidence would be two or more quasi-experimental studies or one controlled study. Some evidence would be more the case studies or evaluations. And expert consensus would be more the non-evaluated research um, or qualitative research. So this is kind of the sum evidence or expert consensus is where most of our, our um, literature came from. So I'm going to talk about, not about the specific literature that we found, um, because there wasn't a lot of really good evidence. Um, what I'm going to talk about instead is kind of the interwoven um, principles that we found throughout the literature that, that um, will inform practice. So um, the interventions that we found, a lot of them had proved to be very effective, but they were done in research settings. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily be able to be used in a practice setting. So what we, we thought would be more useful is to take kind of what worked about that intervention that wasn't the specific, um, the specific intervention itself, but what the, what the principles were that worked. Um, so there, um, I'm going to go through them now. So firstly, uh, practice needs to be flexible. So that means taking, taking account of um, what the needs of the individual are. So for example, with traditional addictions treatment, it can be very rigid. Um, very, very set out, so you do this thing this day, um, whereas for people with FASD that doesn't necessarily work. Um, so something might need to be adapted to, to meet the needs of that person. Secondly, it needs to be individualized. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, individ uh, individuals with FASD are all impacted differently. So you really need to take account of their strengths and their needs when planning services. Uh, number three, it needs to be structured. So that means building routines, um, building in repetition, building in consistent rules and guidelines that will uh, model behavior. It needs to be strength-based. So really focusing on what the person can do and not what can't they do. So for example, we looked at um, one of the uh, models around employment services. So the job coach model, which focuses really on on thinking about what the person's strengths are and where they're gonna best fit, so you're not setting them up for failure. Um, number five, building resiliency and interdependence. Uh, many individuals with FASD may not be able to be completely independent, um, but with support they can gain skills um, to be as independent as possible. Um, so it's really taking the time to build in those kind of external supports and provide as much um, support as needed. 
using concrete language. So this came up, especially in our conversations with justice around parole violations. And it wasn't that the person couldn't do it or was refusing to do it. It was really because they didn't understand the abstract language that parole, um, parole um, information is usually set out. So I think um, for that one, it's just making sure that they're as concrete as possible and making sure that the individual really actually understands. Um, finally, the, this, um, this sh practice should be consistent, so making sure that there's enough repetition for it to be actually held in their memory and making sure that that repetition continues over days and weeks and is not, um, not changed over time. So that can be in terms of information, learning new uh, materials or, behavior or behaviors, as well as with service providers. So it's really important to create those stable relationships. Um, practice should be trauma informed. So considering all of the potential issues that the individual has faced in the past, um, including victimization, including um, discrimination, making sure that you really understand that individual's um, history and, and what they may have gone through and making sure you take that into account in practice. Focusing on early intervention, so that would include um, diagnosis, so the earlier the diagnosis, the, the better the outcomes, but that can also be in terms of intervention. So making sure, um, and this is kind of related to number 10, making sure that you are as early as possible to prevent other outcomes from occurring. So we had an examples from our um, focus groups where we talked about um, individuals who got um, good guardianship in place before they turned 18, so they had financial considerations um, taken care of. And then that, that made sure that they were taking, uh, that they had housing in place, that they had subsidized rent, that they had um, things in place that prevented them from becoming homeless because it's very difficult to go the other way from homeless to house rather than um, um, being proactive at the beginning. And finally the, um, the last kind of overarching principle is to be FASD informed and holistic. So what we found is that um, FASD uh, supports should should go beyond the service providers that are providing supports directly for FASD. Um, all of the surrounding supports really need to have an understanding of FASD and um, what can be done for that specific individual and what they need. Um, so now for more information on what the principles look like in practice, I'm going to hand it over to Candice. Hi there. Um. Well, I'm Candice Windish. I'm the program manager of the Enviro's FASD Intervention Services and the Adult Evolution Program. Um, Enviro's is a not-for-profit organization that supports vulnerable children and families in Calgary. We've been supporting um, children and families in Calgary for 40 years. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary, so that was awesome. Um, and uh, I'm super proud to, to be a member of our organization. It's, uh, we do some excellent work. I'm, I'm really honoured to be working with the people that I work with. We've been providing services to people living with FASD since 2003 and <clears throat> um, I've worked with Dana for many years and you're going to hear from her in a few minutes as well as Jamila and Kaylee and um, also very very honored to be able to present today with these these wonderful women. I learn something from them all the time every day. Um, we have two um, programs, the FASD Intervention Services and the Adult Evolution Program. So one is a program supporting ad, um, sorry, caregivers living with children with FASD and the other is a program supporting adults living with FASD. The two programs are quite different um, but they're similar in, a, um, in some of the, the model that we use. So one of the biggest pieces is that um, we really seek to understand how that individual is impacted by FASD. When Jamila asked me to speak to um, best operationalizing best practice in individualized and flexible supports, which is the topic I'm covering, um, I thought to myself, I have no idea how I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, it's such a, such a deep um, part of our practice and something that's ingrained in just about everything that we do. 
Um, but we really, really want to learn to understand how people are impacted, how specific individuals are impacted by FASD. So we want to look at what their needs are. We want to look at what their strengths are. We want to look at what types of environments they learn best in and what types of environments fit their, their story and their, um, their way of life. Uh, being individualized means that, to us, means that um, not, no two people are affected the same way and so the intervention services that we provide for people need to be reflective of that and so we really do need to understand um, how they're impacted. We use the assessment to help guide us. We are a post-assessment service at Enviros and so um, all of our clients have received an assessment of uh, a diagnosis and assessment of FASD. So we use the assessment to help guide us. Um, we look at the needs and the strengths and then we customize the strategies to help um, with the environment. We believe that being highly informed and highly individual as well as being flexible through our intervention we can provide services that are really really effective and can produce results. Being flexible means that we don't have all the answers. Um, that caregivers and clients tell us what they need and we help them to achieve those goals. We don't have all the answers, we don't have strategies in our back pocket, we just look at um, a lot of information which I'll talk at length about um, in terms of gathering information, strategizing, tweaking the strategies and making sure that everybody understands what the needs are. We're also regularly addressing things like grief and loss, self-care, trauma, relationships and other primary needs. All of our focus um, is, sorry, everything that we do is focused on the intervention. We also use uh, our families, our team, uh, the research literature and all of our partners to help us to learn every day. So we're always looking at different pieces of information that we can bring in to help us understand how this particular individual in front of us has been impacted. So um, lots of reflective practice, lots of adapting, we're always moving and it's a very dynamic process. Um, I've already been there. So understanding the individual, individual's functioning. Um, this is quite a complicated process for us but it's, it's really looking at collecting information and using appreciative inquiry to, to um, gather all of the pieces that we can. So we start with the foundation which is the assessment and that tells us how that individual's, um, what their cognitive functioning is, what their executive functioning looks like. We also look at things like sleep issue, hygiene, uh, all types of pieces that come from the assessment. And so that really is about how that individual's been impacted from, from this medical condition. And then we go to the families and we talk to the families about what's this individual, what are these people, uh, what's their, what do their lives look like? Um, you know, um, what are some of the things that impact them? What are some of the, the areas where they're successful? And how do they live day, day to day? Because sometimes the assessment can be different from how people are actually experiencing life. And uh, that's, that's, I think, true for all of us. So. Um, how, what we look like in an assessment doesn't necessarily translate to what we look like every day. Uh, and then we use behaviors to help, to help guide more information um, regarding behaviors. Um, we believe that a behavior is very often the communication of an unmet need. So anytime we see a behavior, that's more information for us to layer onto the, the pieces of um, the profile. And that helps us to understand who that person is as a whole. So we're taking a lot of different pieces of information, putting them together on the table and kind of, it's almost like putting the puzzle pieces together and trying to figure out um, what's going on for that individual. Um, as I said, we use appreciative inquiry and reflective practice to help us throughout the whole thing. Um, we, we use appreciative inquiry and, and asking good questions, um, reflecting on those questions, looking at how they fit with our families, but we also do that with our peers. So at, back at the office, people will often come together and do consultations like, what's happening for this family? What's the information we know? What does the assessment tell us? What's the family saying? And how's that individual managing their environment? And so 
Um, lots and lots of reflection with the peers as well as the supervisors. We're always leveraging strengths and always looking at how we can use those strengths to um, build the strategies. There's a bit of a tension that exists when we're supporting families and support people um, in any capacity, and that is that um, our role is to, to develop strategies. But very often our families have crisis going on or um, stresses in their life, um, different things that are happening for them, and so there's this tension between trying to um, focus on the, the strategy and the intervention and also helping to support people. And those pieces are critical for us. Those, that uh, combination, that dance that we do between those two strategies is really, really important. When caregivers and teachers and community members and supports all understand how people are impacted by FASD, we do produce better results. We're able to create strategies that help them to learn and grow. Hmm. Using strengths to develop strategies. As I said, um, developing strategies is a difficult topic to talk on. People always want to know, what are some strategies in dealing with people with FASD? And for us, um, you know, there's some, there's some core pieces in terms of addressing uh, anybody's learning, and that is making sure that there's routine and consistency in some of those foundational pieces of learning. Um, but other than that, we don't, have with, we don't come with anything in our pocket. That's all developed through the profile. So the profile is all put together, and then we start to look at the strategy. So I'm going to give you an example um, just to help articulate that a little bit better so that um, because everybody's affected differently. So we've got this young man. He's 15 years old. The school is telling us that he's failing, uh, that he's quite explosive in the classroom. He uses a one-on-one -on -one worker to help him, and often they'll go and shoot some hoops in the, in the gym, and he likes that. That's, it, it helps him to learn. Uh, but when he's with a larger group, when his classmates come in, he, he doesn't manage that well. He's frustrated when he's redirected, and his peer interactions are quite strained. They did tell us that he loves shop class, so that's a, an, an advantage. Um, and he very often ignores or incorrectly follows instructions. We went in and talked to mom, and she says that she believes that he has ADHD. I'm not sure whether somebody told her that or whether that was her own assessment, but she wasn't really sure where the information came from, but she felt like he, she, she, he had ADHD, um, that he liked to have extra space while he worked, and he needed that to be able to manage his environment. She said he doesn't have a lot of friends, but he does like to video game, and he also uses some marijuana. In the environment, uh, we went into the classroom as a specialized setting. It was pretty chaotic. There was lots of stuff going on, lots of other kids in the classroom, and there was a lot of stimulation. Um, the school wouldn't let this young person walk out of the classroom. He wanted to do that. He tried that on many occasions, but uh, they were resistant to that for, for obvious reasons. And very often it looked like he wasn't paying attention. He was doodling while they were talking and instructing and what have you. And while he liked his one-on-one -on -one worker, and that seemed to be a good relationship, he did also become explosive with her as well. The assessment told us that he did indeed have a diagnosis of ADHD, so he was quite distractible. His verbal IQ was lower than his performance IQ, which told us that um, the assessment also said that he's a very hands-on learner, so he liked to learn through doing. The other thing that we learned from the assessment was this, that this young man had also been physically impacted by his FASD, and he had one leg that was just a little bit lo longer than the other. He had some hip dysplasia, and so the ball didn't fit quite properly in the hip socket. Um, and he also had some anomalies with his, uh, the digits on his, his fingers. The, the uh, bones on the structure of his fingers were an issue. Um, we, we had the family talk to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician said, indeed, while this child is sitting for long periods of time or sitting cross-legged or doing anything physical that had to do with those big hip movements, that was going to be both irritating and by the end of the day probably quite painful. So um, that was really interesting. And the assessment information gave us some really good um, information in terms of developing the strategies for this young guy. 
First we started with addressing the, the distraction in the classroom, so we put in many, like several um, uh, strategies for ADHD to reduce the amount of stimulation in his environment. Um, we tried to reduce as much the nonverbal, or the sorry, the, the verbal cueing that he was getting. His one on one, his one on one coach was uh, cueing constantly throughout the day, and the teachers were talking throughout the day, and that was just irritating. And he wasn't able to take in the information. On top of the fact that he was sitting in this in the, in this chair all day long, um, in pain. We um, the family talked to the pediatrician and they trialed some medication for his ADHD and that was also successful. The biggest piece for us um, in terms of the strategy development was the body breaks. So we looked at this young guy was moving, uh, getting up and moving around the classroom and the teachers weren't um, looking at that and believing that he was posturing or being difficult, not sitting still, not listening and that was very, very frustrating for them. But what we learned from uh, all the pieces of information was that he, he needed to be able to uh, move around. And so that was not posturing or defiance, but it was actually a strategy that he was using so that he was physically, emotionally, and mentally able to manage his environment. So we did more of that. We looked at, we talked to the teachers about implementing more body movements and giving him an opportunity to, to move around so that he wasn't irritated and in pain all day. And they were able, the school was able to accommodate that, so that was excellent. Um, this point really, this, this part really drives home a point for me, which is that the, often the behavior is the representation of an unmet need. So in this case, this young guy had a need to move because of his physical anomalies as well as um, the way his brain was processing. And, um, and once the school understood that that was part of his, um, the way he had been impacted and part of his makeup, they were able to accommodate. So we had huge success with that. So really frustrated guy. He was tested and tried all day, every day. And he'd come home and use marijuana as a way to either escape or pain management or what have you. Um, and once we implemented some of those strategies, we were able to decrease some of the stimulation in his, his school environment and at home. We were able to address some of the physical pieces. That use decreased significantly. So a huge success. We were very, very happy. Just another really quick example. We've got a um, had a male um, in the evolution program, and in, by all accounts, he would be considered pretty typical. He he didn't have, um, yeah. Most people would say he he came across as pretty typical. He had just lost his job, and he did have a diagnosis of FASD, so he had been um, referred to our program. He reported feeling overwhelmed. Lots of times, he would struggle with. Um, just not knowing what to do or say, something would come at him, he wasn't really sure what to do, and he would get really, really irritated by that. He had held a job for over a year, and he'd been doing the same job for a year and was really happy doing that. And one day, his employer thought, well, he's been doing a really good job doing this, so now we're gonna have him do this other job, increase his responsibilities. So we came to him and said, good job, we're gonna change things up for you, and he froze. He didn't know what to say or do. He didn't really know whether he liked that idea or didn't like that idea. And he became really embarrassed and self-conscious of the fact that he didn't know how to respond. And so he left the job site. And he was subsequently fired for that. When we talked to him, we were really tempted to start into some problem solving. Let's get you another job. Let's go to your boss and you know, explain why you did that. Um, but what we really needed to do was use uh, appreciative inquiry to help us understand exactly what was happening for him and how what he needed to manage his environment. We could fix the job problem, but what happened the next time he got frustrated? What, what happens the next time he gets asked to do something different? So we really needed to focus on that um, and make sure that people have an understanding of his needs. I think the perception is that when somebody's doing really well in an environment, we kind of want to up the ante a little bit, which is normal and good and part of growth. But if we're not informed about that and we don't know how that person is going to respond and they have um, an FASD, 
it becomes a bit of a trigger point. You, you know, uh, it could work or it could not work. And so it's really important for us to be highly informed and uh, intentional about the strategies that we're putting in place. We went to the assessment and the assessment told us he struggled with complex problem solving, he struggled with transitions, and he struggled with articulation. So those were all what was happening there. We connected him to a job coach who, through um, coaching with us, was able to understand how this individual was impacted by his FASD or some of the pieces that we were looking at. And they were able to go and speak to the employer and bridge the gap between the client and the employer. We implemented some calming strategies for him, so when you get frozen up and you don't know what to do, what are some steps that we can take? Um, ask to step away, take some deep breaths, and it, it was relatively simple strategies, but it was us focusing on what is the actual issue for this individual in this moment, and we were able to tailor the intervention. Hmm. Utilizing all the available information to tweak the strategies. Um, not one size fits all. We, we, not one size fits all. And so what we know is that when we try a strategy, we're putting some pieces together, some puzzle pieces, and we're trying to figure out exactly what's happening for that person. And so um, we try a strategy, and then we go back and ask the caregiver or the supports or the partner, whoever it is that we're working with, to say, how did that go? What happened? Um, what did we learn? Uh, what do we know? What information do we know now that can help us to develop further? And so we're always—it's always a work in progress. We're always tweaking our strategies to try and figure out where to go next. And the relationship with our with our supports is critical. The relationship with the clients, the relationship with the caregivers, the relationships with the teachers and the community supports are a foundational piece to how we manage all of this. Because while we're in there developing strategies and using all this assef assessment information to figure out what's happening, people are also living their lives. And so it's this balance of understanding when we can stay focused on strategy development and when we're looking at things like um, self-care or other, other pieces that families are experiencing. Uh, sometimes it's access to other resources, etc. But it is one step at a time. Uh, ensuring other supports have an individualized understanding. This piece is critical for us in terms of individualized service and flexibility. Um, we have a lot of information, we've developed some strategies, and we've put some pieces in place. And now we want to make sure that that information is transferable. Our families need to understand how the person that they're dealing with or they're living with uh, is impacted by their FASD so that they don't need us forever. Um, we want them to be able to strategize for themselves. We want them to be able to work as a team together. Natural supports. Um, exist around all of us and we use those those supports to help us move through our, our day, our week, and our lives. And uh, people living with FASD are obviously no different than that. Um, we often come up against systems that will tell us, well, we don't want to look at the information, we just want to follow the behavior, and we, 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 want to, we don't want our opinions to be skewed and those types of things. And we really believe that when people are informed and they're, they use appreciative inquiry to help guide their interventions, they're able to be more successful. It's actually individualized. We want to empower our families um, and help them to be able to move on in life. Regarding follow-up, um, we're always asking ourselves, was that successful? Throughout the entire intervention, we're asking, what happened? What did we learn? Where are we going now? And so outcomes are an important part of our service delivery. It's a critical component to what we, how, how we provide supports to people. We need to be adaptive with people's lives, um, and, but we also need to stay objective and we need to stay focused. 
So we use case plans and consultation and reflective practice to help keep us on track while we're uh, managing this, this balance of supporting people. Being flexible and collaborative is critical to equal access and supports that work. We're all working on the same goal, wellness for our children and success in our communities. So quickly I've got um, a couple of quotes from, this one is from a caregiver uh, of somebody, a family that was with our caregiver support program. And it says, as foster parents of twin boys with FASD, we've learned how immensely important it is to be open to adapting our behavior as to best serve our children. Though they came into our care three and a half years ago, we continue to learn that though they're twins and both have FASD, they're both so different in their needs and strengths. Treating them as individuals with their unique gifts to the world has not only helped our family live in a more peaceful way with the boys, but most importantly, an individualized approach has enabled us to help the boys be their best selves. I just love that quote. It's, it's so powerful. It's uh, a, really a gift to us. Um, I've got another quote that I want to um, give you as well. And it's not in the slides, I'm sorry, but I felt like it was important. It's from a professional that we worked with. And she said, this was incredibly helpful for our team. We were reflecting on how amazing it would be if we could all have such a comprehensive outline of our clients prior to them entering services. So we're super proud of, of that. We feel like it's really important to help our clients, but it's also important to impact our community. And so that's, that's part of what we're doing. So very, very proud moment when we have um, people saying stuff like that. It is our belief that individualized and flexible supports comes from not only a formal assessment, but from being informed and intentional with the people that surround people, the, the client living with FASD. This, this informed and intentional service delivery is the crux of our service. We believe it's the right for our families and clients to have effective supports in addressing the impacts of this medical condition. So now I'm gonna pass it over to, to Dana Ormstrup. She's the executive director of the Foothills Fetal Alcohol Society. Thank you, Candace. I'm Dana Ormstrup and I'm the executive director of the Foothills Fetal Alcohol Society, which is a little society, nonprofit society housed in High River, Alberta. And we're kind of the and area part to the Calgary Fetal Alcohol Network. Um, and so our supports for intervention and prevention run in the rural communities um, in I, about a four hour span if you were to drive throughout the span. The society um, provides services to adults with FASD, to caregivers of people with FASD, to pregnant women. Um, we have a professional development focus and a community response focus. So all things FASD is kind of how we're we bill ourselves. We've been around for 18 years and um, for the beginning few years I was by myself in this journey of, of FASD and I was called an FASD specialist I think in the community that we were in and it was my goal to bring um, news about FASD and uh, to, to the local, local communities that we were working in. So we began the process as a steering committee and me of taking a look at what that needed to look like. Um, we became a board about f and a nonprofit organization about four years after that and began the process then of looking at a vision statement and a mission statement and what were our goals and objectives and began to formalize the process of what it was like to bring um, programming into these rural, rural communities. We did this ongoing every year. We did it as a board and a staff. We did it um, with each other continuously. We did it formally every once in a while. And we began about five years ago to begin a journey of looking more formally at we wanted, what we wanted to do that we knew was working, but we weren't sure really why it was working. It wasn't like we were basing all of our work in research. We just knew from the staff collaboration that we had and listening to other folks in the community that what we were doing was working. It was yielding good results, but we wanted to take a better look at why. 
And that's about when the world kind of became more cognizant of the needs to have me good measurement tools. So we needed some project logic models. We needed um, outcomes and indicators. We needed measurement tools and through surveys and evaluation to make sure that we were on the right track and that we could prove that what we were doing was, was good and not just count on, yes, that was really great. I wonder how we know that. So we began that formal process. When Kaylee began her project, Jamila gave, a, gave me a phone call and said, we're doing this really cool best in emerging practice work. Would you like to be involved? And so I got involved a little bit in the committee. And I have to tell you, for those of you that are out there who are um, program leaders like me, that that process of formality can feel a little bit daunting at the very least when you have to sort of take a look at what you're saying, what you're writing, what you're doing, and embedding it in a research document um, or documents and comparing it to literature and other service agencies. So we began that process with Kaylee and Jamila and uh, Calgary Fetal Alcohol Network, and we needed to take a look at what does that really mean for us? What did it mean that the practices that we had been doing for 13 years were suddenly aligning themselves with, with a research document? So as we worked through this process as executive director, program manager, and our staff and our board, we realized um, that we needed to be clear about every program as it embedded itself in our society. And we realized that there were two clear messages that rode through everything that we were doing. One is that our goals always were to promote healthy, stable lives, whether that was for caregivers and their families, whether that was foster families, biological families, grandparents, that the, um, whether it was an adult living with FASD. Um, the promotion of healthy, stable lives was something that was really clear. The second clear message for us is that we wanted to increase resiliency and reduce harm. We came about that, those wordings when we realized we wanted to flip our language. So probably seven years ago, we decided that rather than talk about secondary disabilities, which was then the term, um, we would look at uh, seeing that as um, reducing harm that we would take a look at what we were going to do about it rather than what was there. And instead of at risk, um, and uh, instead of at risk, we were going to talk about being prone to things that needed a set of strengths wrapped around them. And so we looked at resiliency as a way that we could do that. Right about 2013, June hit, and High River was engulfed in a flood. And so we did a little research at that point on what resiliency really looked like because the word took a different turn in High River, Alberta. So we decided that we would take a minute to take a look at what people thought themselves about the term resiliency. In small communities, you have an opportunity anytime you want to go into a community gathering and ask if you can set up a booth and do something fun. So we set up a photo booth and we asked people to take pictures of themselves with a resiliency message to themselves. And then we went back to our office and said, you know what we found out? Every single person defines that risk differently and every single person defines risk differently. As a society then, and taking a look at emerging practice, we needed to make sure that we were matching those concepts with what the world was saying was working well. So at the same time, we realized that the idea of service planning and setting out goals and reaching those goals and measuring the goal attainment was something that we were doing, but more so, what we really needed as a staff was to take a look at a tool that we ourselves could be, could be using to guide our own practice with that human being. So our society is a little bit different. We have a whole bunch of access points that people can come into our society. And because it's one society that meets the needs of all kinds of people in all kinds of communities, there's a time that there's children that I met when they were four or five who are now almost 20 or over 20 and having their own children. That allowed us um, a unique opportunity to take a look at not only what the goals were when that child and their caregiver set was five or six, but it also allowed us to see them in a transition period of 17, 18, and now walk into their lives of adults. And how did we measure how cool that was? Um, how did we match that with the research? How did we do that in our own, at our own desks with our own laptops? And what did that really look like? And what the staff said to me, our staff, was I need something to guide my own practice. I get setting up goals, and I get that reviewing those goals 
um, is important with people. But I need something where the um, overwhelmingness of this individual's life um, doesn't overtake me and the work that I need to do with this person. So because I've been around for a really long time, 18 years, and can go back to the, the original concept of 18 years ago was that people needed an external brain. And when I think about my own life and I look at my own journey with um, human services and in my own personal life, isn't that true? That in that moment, you need somebody to help you manage your thought. You need someone to help you manage what was going on and that person becomes your external brain, your exper external partner for that period of time. So we took a look at what that was going to be, and we realized that um, what we needed to do, what people were asking us to do, is to help them find resources, to help them self-advocate, that pa caregivers were saying, how come I'm so sad when I think that I have to go and tell another teacher another story about my human being? What is it about grief and loss that impacts caregivers and adults with FASD as they learn about their own brain? We have always believed, and I have a strong belief personally as well as professionally, in, in the importance of natural supports. So are these people being introduced to people who are going to stick with them forever? Are these people in, being introduced to people who are going to stick with them for this part of their journey? Are those people always paid? Or are, the, are those people going to stick around for a long time just because they're great people in the communities that we work in? And the last principle was we realized that what we really were doing with some of our caregivers and our adults is helping them take good care of themselves through self-care. Well, isn't it interesting that a lot of what Kaylee talked to us about was already out, was outlining in emerging practice. How cool is that? We wanted to make sure that there was some way that we could line up this emerging practice with what we were already doing, um, put it into some sort of framework with measurement and indicators and outcomes and outputs and all those kinds of things, and that the, as a group we needed to help um, manage that piece. We linked it to emerging practice because we had the opportunity to do that at that moment. That it wasn't necessarily that we were doing anything different, but now we were able to say, hey, this is working and the research is supporting that. Or the research is saying, and we're supporting that, and it became this give and take of, of this new document and this new emerging practice that was already um, happening in what we were already doing. We knew we needed some way to keep track for the staff of how they knew what they were doing. And so about a year ago, we developed a template that we use um, to guide staff practice, not client practice, not caregiver practice, but a, a template that can keep the staff focused that will then translate to the work that they do with the person. And we called it a SOAR plan. And each of those, the letters in the SOAR plan stand for something. For today, I don't know if we'll have time, I'll take a look, but um, for today we're going to talk about the O because the O in, this, in the SOAR plan is strength-based, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. The SOAR plan guides everything that we do and is looked at regularly, particularly for today's um, webinar. We're going to talk about strength-based support, and then the second Cayley study um, thing, which is building resiliency, self-advocacy, and, inter and interdependence. Again, for those of you that are out there listening, the cool thing about this is that you're probably already doing it. Now you get a chance to match it to the science. And um, I don't know that any of us go into work in human services without recognizing that we got into it because we believe that there's some strengths there. So putting a word strength-based support on it um, requires us to do a little reflecting on how do, what does that really mean? We've been doing it forever. We've been looking at people's strengths forever, or we wouldn't stay here. What does that mean as it relates to hope and everything else? And what does it, what does it look like in the research? In our SOAR plan, a staff has the opportunity to um, take a document that we ask them to look at quarterly. So every four months or so, pull out the SOAR template and take a look if you're keeping yourself on track with what you're doing with this person. The O is for optimizing strengths. Because we were looking at resiliency post-flood, because we had a SOAR plan, because there was a new document, because we got more invested in taking a look at what other people were doing, um, we began to really focus this on not a kind of roll your eyes, of course, we're strength-based, but what does that really mean? 
At our society, the programs that the Calgary Fetal Alcohol Network fund um, is a program called Caregiver Response and Adult Response. And while response is kind of one of those words that no one's quite sure about, we do that because we want it to reflect responsiveness. And like Candace was talking about, we want it to reflect individualized support. Um, individualized support. We have the opportunity to bring people together. We have the opportunity to have a resource center that people can drop into. And we have the opportunity to support individuals in both of those programs, caregivers and adults, one-to-one -one for whatever they need. So the slide shows you that this is some, um, some groupings of our adult programs. So one of them is, was a cooking program. And we did this because we had a bunch of adults that said, hey, a strength for me is cooking. That seems pretty easy then, let's bring them together and start a little cooking program. And because we believe in our society that resilience by nature is um, lifted or raised or increased when uh, people have an opportunity to contribute, we match that strength-based um, concept with the concept of con contributing and giving back to your community. After the flood, we had lots of opportunity to practice that because there was lots of opportunity to, to contribute. And so some of the, one of the slides, you can see there's a, a child with multiple handicaps sitting behind on the pink pillow there. That's uh, the cooking program group went out and they delivered meals to um, families that were particularly impacted by the flood. At our society, we have a, a PowerPoint that we've been asked to do once in a while that's called Me a Superhero. And that's all about looking at an, indi an individual's strengths, allowing them to build on those strengths, whatever they are, and putting them into practice so they can go out and contribute. And uh, the title comes from one of our adults who said, uh, who was thanked and by, a little, by that little girl with a disability who said, you know what, you're a superhero. And he said, me, a superhero? He'd never been asked before. He'd never been asked. To, to do anything in his community. So by helping him build on his strengths and go into his community, um, he still laughs about needing a blue cape. The person at the bottom left there behind the microphone um, is, a, is a person that I've supported since he was seven. And uh, one of the th his strengths uh, was speaking. He wanted to tell his story of FASD. He wanted to st tell his story often. He's also a great singer. And so the first thing we did um, in our program is hook him up with Toastmasters. So it was an individual strength that his individual person, um, staff person from our society worked on, but we hooked him up with a community that already had people together that had those strengths, a strength in speaking, and he continues to be a speaker for us today. As other adults in our, our uh, world got to know him and got to listen to him and watch his journey with Toastmasters and see him speak, they said, I think that's something I'd like to do too. And so I'm not sure any of them would l have listed public speaking as a strength, but they certainly listed it as an interest. So we got them together and we started teaching them how to tell their story. And so we have a panel of adults now who can sit in rural communities so far and tell their story. They work on um, presentation and they can tell you all kinds of ways that they have built their strength in that area and they can tell you all kinds of ways that this helps them become self-advocates, which, guess what, is an emerging practice. The caregivers in our caregiver response program began to look at strengths not only in themselves but for the children. And if you work with caregivers out there, you know they get stuck in one of those places or the other. They go to a caregiver support program where they talk about their own strengths, or they go to schools and they talk about their child's. Um, we, when we work with our caregivers, go back to our SOAR plan, say what are the strengths involved in this unit? What is this family good at? What is the child good at? What is the caregiver good at, the child, youth, or the adult? But what are they also good at as a youth? So in that optimized strength part of the SOAR plan, you will see a staff write down, this family loves going skiing together. This family doesn't do anything outside the house together, but they sure do love each other. This family loves to sit and read after supper. So recognizing that strength-based had not only to do with a specific skill set, but it had to do with the dynamic as well. I'm going to tell you about that slide in the middle because it looks, um, it looks a little different than the other slides. That's a picture of my husband, our horses, and a little boy with cerebral palsy. And it has nothing to do with FASD and everything to do with FASD all at the same time. 
So I was standing in line at a campground and met the woman that's in that picture. She didn't have her child with her and told me that her son was particularly infatuated with horses. Were we staying at the horse campground? I said, we were. And she said, do you think I could bring my son by to see the horse? She said, he really, really loves horses. And I said, of course you can. We're in sight, whatever. Come on by. So breakfast time the next day, I knew nothing about her child. Breakfast time the next day, uh, we see a car pull up and she gets out of the car and she said, I met you yesterday at the ice cream place at the campground. I said, yes, I recognize you. She said, is it okay if I bring my son? I said, sure. And he had multiple disabilities, multiple cerebral palsy. And what happened in that moment was that everybody's best part got exposed. And how cool was that, that my shy, introverted husband, who just would like to get on his horse and go away, held that child and put him on a horse, and that the mom got a chance to see her son be involved with horses in a very meaningful way. And I cried, because that's what we would have done at that point. One of the chances that uh, we have at our society is to offer groups of people to come together and share their strengths, and share their self-advocacy skills, and, sh and share their self-care techniques, all uh, emerging best practices. Um, in local, um, I don't know how to say this, they're, they're groups that design what they want to do in the, by themselves in their own communities. So we have a format and those groups of people decide what they want to do in order to bring out the best of them in that moment. So that picture is a group of dads. We have a group uh, called Tool Time where dads get together and dads talk about emerging practices way different than moms. Moms will get their head around language. Dads just want to do it. and um, they do that really quite neatly. I would, I would recommend that anybody bring dads together. They have a very, very unique perspective. One of our um, women's groups is called Breathe. We bring them together quarterly. It's a focus on self-care. We also have grandparents groups, bio groups. We have groups that meet together three times because they want to discuss a particular issue with the whole benefit being when you leave this group, you're going to feel better about yourself because you're going to meet other people that, that lift you up. You're going to have better information so you can out there, be out there being a better self-advocate. You're going to learn about some other resources, so we're going to promote interdependence. What are those? Emerging best practices. We're already doing them. So to finish, I guess I want to say that you can see that my theme is kind of, you're probably already doing it. All you need to do is get a hold of a document, get a hold of a friend or a fellow professional and say let's take a little bit more time to be carefully planning, meaningfully planning, um, working out all these kind of crazy paperwork things that are all of a sudden in the world. And don't get frightened by words like outcomes and indicators and project logic models. It's hard to get our thoughts down in paper, but once you do, you know that you're setting yourself in line with everything that the government is saying and everything that the world is saying um, that you need to do. And believe me, I know that's not easy. Um, I, I think that my staff can tell you what days I have to work on our outcomes and indicators and when I'm getting ready for an application and which project logic model am I going to use for this program. It's not easy but it has been really, really helpful. I want to thank um, uh, CFAM and the world of FASD and Kaylee for her great research project, Candace for just being a great professional support to me, and um, urge you to go out there and take a look at the research. And now you get to go back to Jamila. Thank you, Dana. You're always dynamic and exciting as usual. No more disappoint. Thank you. And so uh, you can see from just the presentations from Candice and Dana that there is quite a depth and still a quite a, a deep range of services that are available to the Calgary Fetal Alcohol Network or CFAN. We did mention we kept saying this project, this report. I do want to actually name it. It is called the Best in Emerging Practices for FASD Supports Across the Lifespan, and it is available on our website, www.mycfan.ca. And in, to close, before we go to questions, I did want to talk about, so we've, we did this project, we did, engaged our community, um, and what came out of that? What were some of the implications for CFAN? And I would say that we had a number of different learning points, but two major ahas that came through, for me at least as the executive director for CFAN, was A, Dana mentioned this, we actually were not starting from the ground up we had quite a bit of evidence-based practice already happening within our network. And so that was really a comfort for us to know, particularly when you're stewarding public dollars, 
to know that we are actually funding really high quality evidence-based interventions for individuals as well. Perhaps we're not um, offering as much of it as we would like due to constraints of resources, but the ones that we were offering we really felt were, um, were high quality and ones that we can stand behind. The second aha for me was uh, not so much that there was one particular type of best practice that we could use, but we learned that there was best process. That so much of the work was how we did the work, not necessarily that end outcome piece, which we still care about, but the process of the work was just as important in terms of the outcomes that we achieved. So uh, Candice mentioned the individualized approach, needing to understand the flexibility of that. So much of that is a process and an approach to work, as opposed to necessarily what that outcome will be, which is also important. So for us at CFAN, the first thing we did was try to implement a process-based evaluation. It became clear that FASD-informed approaches was really the critical bedrock of everything that we did. And so rather than um, try to uh, do more work around what that looks like, as a network, we wanted to understand how our network was doing that in a more descriptive form. So uh, we changed our half-year report template to really ask those workers and supervisors and managers working in our programs to really sit down and reflect how are they actually doing this work and so now they're reporting back to us how are we aligned to these principles what is it that I'm doing in my own practice that really al aligns to this and put it in a descriptive or, nar or narrative form so this really does two things it allows uh, reflective practice it allows a pause for someone to really say am I doing this and how am I doing it and why is it challenging or why is it working? And so you can see that even throughout today how Dana reflects on that quite a bit. And then we also, it really forces you to not just check a box but really to describe it. And, and so you, it forces you to then, even if you're not doing it, the next time you sit down to do that, you will actually make some kind of a continuous improvement or some kind of a quality improvement in doing that. So really focusing on the process. But we know that the outcome still matters for the individual. What happens with that client, that individual or family, we still care quite deeply about. So one of the things we did was we completely changed our surveys that we were using to really begin to say, if we're going to work with individuals, if we're gonna use our time and their time and their resources and our resources, let's understand what is the difference we're making with those and is it aligned to what uh, we're seeing in the research and the evidence. So we actually amended that tool quite a bit, and this is the first year that we're going to be using that tool. The research was finished in April 2016, so this is the first year, full year of actually trying to implement this tool. So we're really excited to see what the survey data will show us in terms of what are the needs that individuals are expressing that they need service in, and how are they seeing uh, support in those areas specifically. And finally for CFAN, we want to be a learning organization. And so commitment to continuous learning and quality improvement is just a value that we hold as an organization. And so we're never at a point that we say, okay, we're done, because this is always emerging practice. It's really not so much like Kelly said, where the evidence, evidence is at is really a commitment to learning, a commitment to reflection, a commitment to improvement, a, commi a commitment to capacity building. And so really where we're at is that we're still on the learning journey. We would never as a network say that we've, we've arrived. I, I think that we, while we know that we're doing good work, we know that this is a journey and that we have a long way to go in, in continuing to understand how we can continue to, to support individuals more effectively. So I would say that's where we're at as a network. We welcome any questions from any of the panelists here today. And so I'm going to open it up to the floor. All right, so our first question today is, how engaged were your service providers throughout this whole research process? Thank you, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think one of the things that was really important because when you are stewarding funds, there is a power differential involved in that, that it was really important for us to not feel like the people that we were partnering with in the community and depending on to do the work did not feel done to, but that they were a part of that process. And so the first thing we did was convene a community advisory committee where we opened up um, the, the goal of the project, the intention of the project to anyone in the community that was willing to join us. And so that was really, really effective because I think that journey of process really engaged existing service providers in their work and it also allowed them to share their work. And so it was not done in isolation of, of existing practice. 
So those people who had practice currently happening that was seeing results were that work was able to be incorporated into the evidence table that we were using. And so I think that that allowed, so at the point where we got, where we actually changed some of the tools we were using, we had a lot of support within our network for that already because none of it was a surprise and all of it was very open and transparent. And I think we had a lot of support from our network in terms of um, buy-in for that process. And so I would say that it was um, quite, a, quite important for us to engage the community. Great, our next question here is, uh, please describe the kind of services provided by your network. Yeah, um, so because we partner with the Alberta 10-year FASD strategy, we do provide supports in the three main areas of targeted prevention, supports for individuals and caregivers, and assessment and diagnosis. So um, I won't speak so much around the targeted prevention, which is the PCAP uh, model program that we, that we support, as well as the assessment and diagnosis, because that's quite clear. Um, where we have more of a variety of services is really in our supports area. So that, like I, you can see even from today, there's quite a, um, a, a rich depth and variety in there. We do have two rural partners that we work with, um, Foothills Fetal Alcohol Society. Dana, the executive director, is, is that partner. And I would say that they are probably our main rural partner, but we also work with Siksika Health Centre, who does work primarily on the Siksika Nation as well. Uh, and then within the city of Calgary, we've got um, about five main um, FASD-specific programs that work with individuals and caregivers. And so most of those programs are case management, one-to-one -one outreach services. Um, some One focuses on youth as they transition into adulthood. Another one focuses on um, individuals engaged in the justice system. We also have uh, f programs that focus on adults that are single, unattached adults who are suspected or diagnosed with FASD. But then we also have um, the program at Enviros that uh, Candace spoke to, which is a post-diagnosis and post-assessment service that is specific to individuals and caregivers as well, in, that are, that's primarily focused in the city of Calgary. And then through the network ourselves, we also do what we're calling kind of light touch supports which is um, having a, a network resource worker that does more crisis intervention. Candace mentioned that tension between trying to address immediate crisis needs and stabilization and then looking at the longer term, uh, more sustainable support. And so this position is really more on the, on the former end of that than the latter. So we also offer that through the network. And our last question today is around the SOAR plan. Um, we're just wondering what the other letters in the word SOAR mean and, and how we can go about getting Great. more information on that. I'll actually have Dana speak to that. Okay, so it's just new, the SOAR plan, what the other letters stand for. And remember, this is a guiding thing for the staff. It isn't a goal set by, by the person necessarily. That's done in a different place, in a different conversation at a different time. This is our staff's keeping up a, uh, a document and keeping their mind going on what do I, what can I do now, what can I do now, what can I do now. So SOAR, the S stands for structure the environment. If you look at any sort of study or you talk to anybody, we all know that um, an individual with FASD or the caregiver does best when their environment is best and stable. So that's anything from um, one of our staff saying, I, I need to get him a new living spot, I need to get him a spot to live, to we need to take his, his posters out of his bedroom. So, so the structure, the environment, do they have a driver's license? Are they, we live rurally, we work rurally, so do they have barriers um, around accessing service due to transportation? That'll go in that column. So anything to do with structure the environment. O stands for optimized strengths. A stand for, stands for advocate for what's needed. So the advocacy piece there to keep the staff remembering on what advocacy looks like. Where does self-advocacy come into place? Where does this person need an advocate? Is it the child that needs an advocate? Does the teacher need an advocate? And can we go in and look at coding issues and those kinds of things? Anything around advocacy goes in there. R stands for respect autonomy. So are we making sure that this is something that the caregiver or the, cl or the adult themselves with FASD has a say in? Um, um, so that's what it stands for. That's a SOAR plan. If you look on our website one of these days, that soon, that SOAR plan is going to be up there. Um, I think that, that having a template that you design yourself in your own agency probably would be better than using one that someone else designed. Um, but one day, the Foothills Fetal Alcohol Society is going to come out and teach about the effectiveness of having a staff plan that goes beside an individual service plan.
Great, thank you, Dana. So I just wanted to end by saying thank you to everyone who joined us today on the webinar. We encourage you to stay tuned for information at our, uh, for our next session um, on, a, on the FASD webcasts. To get updates and registration information about each session, please email us at fasd at gov.ab.ca and ask to be added to our mailing list. You can also find past and future webcasts at http uh, colon two forward slashes at fasd.alberta.ca. So that's fasd.alberta.ca or sign up at hslearningseries.ca. Today's webcast was recorded and the video will be posted online along with videos from all the previous webcasts. The video link will be sent out to all registrants in the near future and we encourage you to share this video with anyone that you think may be interested. If you had feedback about today's session, please email us at fasd at gov.ab.ca and let us know. You will also be receiving a feedback email from us. Please take the time to let us know what you thought of today's webcast. We'd love to hear your ideas and hope you have a wonderful afternoon and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you.